For our scripture reading, please turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Again, that's 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Now let's turn to Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered, or a drunkard, or violent, or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, thanks for that, Myla. Appreciate that. So hopefully you have your Bibles opened already to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Uh, I would like to pray, and then we're going to jump into the sermon for today. Father, we, we ask right now, Lord, uh, I, I just confess again how strange it is to, to speak when I'm used to, to seeing faces to speak to a camera. And I just want to confess that and say, God, would you, would you help me as, as I, want, I, want to, I want to preach with conviction and I want to preach with, with knowing that, there are, that your people are, are looking to this to receive from your word uh, on this Sunday. Uh, and so, in, but yet here I am on Friday. So God help, help this situation, Lord. It's never going to feel normal. Uh, but at the same time, God, would you, would you come and would you fill in the gaps that we are, are lacking here? Would you pour out more grace in a time where we are greater and more in need, both as a society and as a church than we ever have been before? So God, we ask you to come. We ask for your power to be upon us right now. Help us to hear your word. That's what we want. We don't want to hear from a speaker or a preacher. What we ultimately want is to hear from you through your word. So God, would you come in power and help us to apply it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we are continuing our series on elders and the local church. And this is actually the last of four, uh, a series of four uh, sermons that are done on, on looking at elders and how and who they are and what they're supposed to be doing and also the local church and what the local church is supposed to be doing and how these two groups, if you will, inter interrelate with each other. Uh, so in the last few weeks, we've looked at the relationship between um, um, elders in the church a lot. We've looked at that, you know, what is the church supposed to do? What are elders supposed to do? Um, we've looked at uh, church members' responsibilities. So what is a church supposed to do? And then how are elders supposed to come along and help with, with what's happening there? Um, and, and, and then we've, we've also looked at, um, who, who are, what are some of the characteristics that an elder is supposed to have? And really that is what we're going to be zeroing in on today and focusing on. We're going to be focusing on elders particularly, and we're going to be asking ourselves the question, what is an elder as far as character qualifications? What is an elder supposed to have as part of his character that makes him fit for leading in that role? within the church. And so this week we're going to look at uh, a text that really lays out, in my opinion, the job qualifications uh, of an elder. So we're in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and <coughs> excuse me, and, and I see, as I'm reading 1 Timothy 3, I'm seeing the text divide up into four sections, okay? And we're going to look at those four in a second. 
And I believe each and every one of these sections in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, is really asking a question. And it's asking a question of anyone who is a potential elder candidate or who would like to be in what one day. Maybe right now you feel like for you, uh, being an elder is not something that you would, would desire. But what, why not in five years? Why not in a few years to come? Uh, and so for, for you, consider these questions that we're going to be asking. And, and really look and think hard. What does God's word have to say about the character, the internal character of a man who is desiring uh, to be an elder in God's church? And so here's the main point if you're, if you're taking notes. Men who are qualified as elders, desire to be elders, care well for others, and know how to humbly fight sin. Now let me say that one more time. Men who are qualified as elders desire to be elders, care well for others, and know how to humbly fight sin. So let's look at our text now and see these four uh, questions for a potential elder. So 1 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Here's how Paul starts off. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. So let's just start with verse 1 here. And here's the question that I think verse 1 is asking of you, if you are a potential candidate for an elder. Do you want this? Okay, so the first question, do you want this? And here's the point that we want to make. Qualified men have a holy ambition to care for God's people. Okay, so qualified men have a holy ambition to care for God's people. So as, as I see this text, verse 1 here, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task, I see what's under what, what I think is underneath this text is, is the idea that you really need to aspire, you need to desire the role, otherwise you, you're, you're, not, you're not qualified as an elder. In other words, we don't want to put somebody in place as an elder who doesn't desire to be an elder. Okay? And, and I'm going to say right off the front end, there may be reasons why momentarily for a season of your life, you don't desire to be one, and it's right for you not to desire that. And there may be a time where a family member or someone close to you who you need to care for is especially sick or is especially in need, and your responsibilities, your sort of free time, if you will, outside of your normal job and other things, is going towards something that really requires your time and attention. So we're not talking about time on YouTube or Netflix. We're talking about a, a very specific situation where you're saying, man, I, I've got to pour my time into this particular thing. And it would be right for you to say at that time, I don't desire this. This is not something that I desire at the moment. However, I do think that for men in general who are who are, um, who are who are believers, who are trusting in the Lord, who are growing in their faith, there should be a sense in which they say, Lord, would you give me a desire? Would you give me a desire to actually lead and to serve God's people in a particular way uh, in this leadership role? So the text is saying, look, if you desire this, this is a good thing. This is something that you should desire. In fact, I would say it's a qualification for you to desire this. But it's strange because desiring something in the church, desiring a position of leadership, is not always something that we're comfortable with, not in the world and not in the church. To, to desire something feels like, well, isn't that ambitious? Isn't that, isn't that essentially me saying, I want to sort of rise up the ranks and power and authority and all of these things? So I want to talk for a minute about ambition. I want to talk about what, what does it mean to say that you desire a position of leadership. Ambition is a difficult word. It speaks to us of maybe an employee who is willing to do whatever it takes to rise up the ranks of the corporate ladder, right? So he or she is willing to step on the necks of other people if it, if it means that, that they can get that next promotion to get that next spot. And man, they're just, they're just pushing people out of the way as they're going towards that goal, right? We've, we've all kind of have that idea in our mind of, a, of, a, of an employee who does that. Or how about a politician? A politician who 
uses maybe a crisis like what we have now, and I'm not thinking of anyone in particular, this is not a political statement, but someone who would use a crisis to, to further their own political gains, right? And we just go, ugh, that's just, that's disgusting. That is not what we're talking about here. That, that, that's, um, that is not the kind of thing we want to see, right, in Christ's church. And so ambition hits us in this weird way. We, we, we tend to think of it as a negative term. But think about this. Romans chapter 15, verse 20, here's what Paul says in Romans 15, 20. And thus, speaking about preaching the gospel, okay, I make it my ambition, there the English word is used, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel. So Paul has no problem, at least in, his, in the English translation of Paul, to use the word ambition. He has an ambition. There is a deep desire that he has. So he had ambition. Now, the Greek word here is not so much an individual um, self-gain ambition. The, the, the Greek word is the idea of aspiring to serve others. And that's what we're getting at here. It's a kind of ambition that places the other, the other person, at the forefront, right? It, it places them at the highest pinnacle. It, it's differed from the idea of selfish ambition, which also shows up in the Bible, right? And obviously always in a negative sense. So you've, you've, got, you've got Paul here who says, I have an ambition that the gospel should be preached. Well, well, well how is that serving others? Well, the gospel going out might mean that some hear the gospel, or turn from their sin, turn to Christ, and actually their eternity is changed. So for Paul to say, I have an ambition to preach the gospel, is a good thing. And I think anybody who reads scripture would say, yes, we want that ambition in Paul. We want him to have that fervency to see this thing go forward. What we're trying to get away from is the idea of an ambition that is self-serving. And so... I don't think we should shy away from this word, ambition. For instance, it shows up again in 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Paul says, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Well, that word aim there is the same Greek word as he used in Romans for ambition. We make it our ambition to please him. Again, what's happening here? My ambition, my fervent desire, and the thing I'm striving after is to aim at the Lord's pleasure. Okay, so that is a that is a good thing. That's the kind of thing we're, we're wanting for, we're aiming for when it comes to uh, looking at men who, who would be potential elders in the church. So there needs to be a kind of godly ambition in an elder. They need to have a desire to serve other, others, and it needs to be a fervent desire, not the self-seeking kind we see in politicians, the kind of the kind of others seeking ambition. That, that really characterizes a man who's willing to love and care for and, and really uh, lay down his life for a church. And so, but, but that same drive and effort that we've seen in, in, the, in sort of the individual self-serving ambitious person, that same drive we want to see. We want to see that same drive. It's just that that drive needs to be oriented in another direction. It needs to be oriented outward in service, not inward in me, 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 me. So one of the things that I've seen uh, just in, in applying this, this whole idea, one of the things I've seen in our day and age is a lack of ambition amongst men in the church. Uh, I, I think we have seen this through some statistics. For instance, men... Um, Men in, in, in a society in general, in, in the world in general, uh, especially in the last few decades, uh, we have some, some interesting statistics here. So, for instance, if you compare just men and women, um, men are less likely to go to college now than women. Women are, at, women are now at about 60% to 40% uh, of men. So if you just consider the fact that, okay, well, the, the population is still 50-50, men and women, uh, there are now 60% of women, um, so, uh, college campuses are going to be 60% composed of women on average. Some are much higher, obviously some are a little lower, but, but you're going to see uh, more than that, more women than men now in, in a, in a, on a college campus. Men are less likely to graduate from college now. 
okay? Uh, men are less likely to move out of their parents' house, sort of at a, if you, if you just select like an age range and you say, okay, at this point you will often, you will now find more men who are living at home than women, okay? So, the, and that this is, there's different reasons for that, right? Some, some men might be living at home to, to be saving up for a house or things like that. So, uh, statistics are always difficult, right? But, but one of the things we're seeing is we're just seeing a general trend where we're seeing men, at least in my opinion, taking less and less responsibility for themselves and for others. And it's scary. I think it's scary for our society. Uh, and, and how about in the church? We've known for a long time that there are more women in the church than men. Okay, that's an easy statistic uh, to, to, to see. Women also, it seems, tend to take on more ministry responsibilities than men do. So when there's an opportunity to serve or to care for someone else or, or something like that, women are usually more prone to do that. Now, again, I, I don't, I, the, the, the statistics here are always difficult because there can be multiple reasons why something is the case. But I'm just saying this is what we're seeing. This is some of the Pew research that's, um, that's come out, and you can look this stuff up on, on Pew's web, website. Um, there are reasons for this. There are probably multiple reasons for this. Um, one of the problems with citing statistics is that we, we can oftentimes get really um, focused on one particular thing or assign one particular reason to it. But I think we can agree this is a phenomenon. This is happening. It's happening in our world. It's happening in our church. And, and I, I want to, to um, before getting into that or applying that or thinking, like, well, what do we do about that? I want to address something real quick. So I know that you're probably hearing my hearing me right now talk, and you're thinking, um, why 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 is he talking about men here? Like why is he so focused on men? Does he only have right? Does he only have one? Like men are like fifty percent or less in the church. So does he only care about like half of the church right now? I think that I think that's an honest question that has to be asked. Why are we talking about men when it comes to elders, and why are we talking about men in general? when it comes to, 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 to leadership, and why am I preaching a sermon right now that's particularly aimed at, at men? And I think it's a fair question to ask. Why, why, are, why are we doing this? Uh, number one, and I'm not going to argue for this in this sermon. I do have other, uh, other sermons you can look up online where I'm going to make an argument for this, but I, I, I believe Scripture uh, says that elders are to be men. Okay, and so that's just a statement I'm going to make, and you say, well, you've got to back that up. Yes, I, I'm going to back that up in other sermons, but, but for today, because of the, the time that we have, uh, I'm going to make that statement that the scripture would say elders, the leaders of the church, are to be men. And then um, I, I think that when we're talking to men here in particular, if, if these statistics are true, and if we're seeing men sort of stepping back from their responsibilities in general, then I want to argue that women should be concerned about this as much as men are concerned about this. Women have to live with men. And so if you're a woman and you and you feel like, yeah, uh, th that's a problem. I agree that that's a problem. They've They've, they've been, I agree that those statistics are true. Realize that if you're a single woman, there's going to be a point in your life, perhaps, where you're going to marry one of these men, right? And, and, and for you to, to, to marry one of these men, that man's ability to succeed and to take on leadership and to bear a responsibility over your family, that is something you're looking for in a mate. That's something that you're desiring. And so for you to say, Gosh, that's a man problem. Let that you know. Let the men deal with that. Talk to the women. It is is I think short sighted because I think what's behind this sometimes is the way our culture is now pitting team man against team woman, and I think that's horribly destructive. In the church, what we need to be doing is we need to be saying, look, there is a problem here. We're recognizing a problem that more and more men are moving away from the church, away from leadership roles, and, and, and women need to say, that isn't good for us. That isn't good for society as a whole. We need to get to the heart of this. And I think one of the things that God's word can do is give us reasons for that. And, and one of the things that I think just simply needs to happen right on the front end is that the church needs to call men 
into leadership. So if you're a man and you're hearing my voice right now and you are a Christian, take leadership responsibilities in your church. Let that be a place where you begin, if you're a single man especially, where you begin to take on the, relate, the, the, the leadership of a family so that you're prepared to step into an actual family when you get married. Let the church be a place where you get to, uh, along with other people, get, get to kind of um, have a chance to care for people before you're caring for a wife and children. Uh, men that are married. Let go beyond the, the, the nuclear family in the sense of, okay, I've got my family. That's all I need to care about. I'm not going to let, I'm not going to let any go take any responsibilities outside of that. I would encourage you to let your responsibility grow. Let your desire, let the, the weight that's upon your shoulders to grow a little bit. If there's a, if there's an inclination not to, because sometimes the reason that we can not want our responsibility to grow is a selfish reason. And so uh, this, this sermon is really in many ways, uh, it's a call to men. But I hope women, I hope you're praying along with me for the men in your life or the future men in your life, that they would hear this and they would respond because this is going to be for your well-being as a woman who's in their life. So enough said about that. That's a quick side note. It's just as far as why are we, are we talking to men in this sermon and really in the last few sermons? Why is it so important? I think we've got a problem, and I think the church needs to call men to action. And so, men, the first step, the first question that you need to ask yourself is, do I desire this responsibility? Do I desire to take on the responsibility to lovingly shepherd and care for a church? And if not, why? Why? And that's not something I can answer in your heart. There could be multiple reasons why that is. And there might even be good reasons. But my question to you is why? Can you search your heart and can you say, why don't I want to take on that responsibility right now? Or five years from now? Or at a season of life when I know that that's a good, that there's a, there's a, that's a, that's a good thing for me to do. All right, let's move on in our text. 1 Timothy 3 will be in verses 2 through 3. So the first question was, do you desire this? So men who are qualified to become elders are men who desire to be elders. How about, let's look at the next ones now. Verses 2 and 3. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. So all of a sudden we have this, this list here that shows up. Now here's the question that I think this whole list is asking of you. Are you a warrior against your own flesh? Are you at war against your own flesh? And here's the statement. Qualified men can show a track record of feeding their spirit rather than their flesh. Okay, I'm going to say it one more time. Qualified men can show, they can demonstrate a track record of feeding their spirit over their flesh. Your life as a Christian is a constant battle between two people that are inside of you. Why do I call them people? Why are there people inside of you? Okay, so, so the first is this. The first is that you have within you, if you're a Christian, you have within you the Holy Spirit. Now, Scripture calls him a person. What does that mean? It means that he... That, that he like the other members of the Trinity, right? Like, like the Father and the Son has a personality. He is a, a thinking, intelligent being, way beyond intelligent, right? That isn't even, even the right word to describe him, but you get what I mean. He is a person in the sense that he has personality. He has characteristics of a person, and he isn't just a force, right? This, this is one of the common things in theology that we need to be careful of. The Holy Spirit isn't just a force. The Holy Spirit is a person. The three persons of the Trinity. Okay, so if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. This is why Paul says, uh, when he's talking about a particular sin, he says, do you not know, Christian, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Okay, so if your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit, that means that there's a residing of the Holy Spirit inside of you. So there's, the one, there's one person inside of you. What about the other person? The other person is what we typically call in the Bible the flesh. Okay, it is sin. 
personified. It is sin as an actual person. Now, you might think that's as strange as the one that, that I would say Holy Spirit is a person. Sin isn't just a force. Sin is a thinking person because it will actually try to come up with plans to attack you and tempt you. Now, if you've ever been tempted, I mean, if you've ever really considered your temptation, you realize that this is the case. You realize that, the, that this isn't just a, I generally desire some sin. You're desiring a sin at a particular time when an enemy, an enemy force, an enemy thoughtful enemy force that's making plans has decided to specifically tempt you at your weakest moments. This is why temptation will oftentimes strike at moments where, where the enemy knows you're at your weakest. And we call him an enemy because he's actually a thoughtful, thoughtful in the sense that he thinks thoughts, person. So inside of you is two persons. Now, listen to the way God describes sin for a minute. This is Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. He's talking to Cain and he says this, If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, listen, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must overrule it. You must rule over it. Does that sound like a person to you? It crouches at your door. Its desire is contrary to you. It wants what you don't want. It wants what you hate. And yet it can crouch. And yet it can desire. It wants things for you. That should terrify any Christian. That we don't just generally have these sort of animal desires that we long, like that's what psychologists sometimes call it, that we long for things that we shouldn't have. Uh, we have an enemy who in some sense lives inside us and in some sense is us. And there is this battle waging between the spirit and the flesh that's inside of us. Here's how Galatians characterizes that. Galatians 5, 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So Galatians is describing this battle, right? It's describing this war that's waging inside of every single Christian. And an elder is to be fighting that war with intensity. An elder is to be a warrior. And it's not a warrior against other people. Not in the traditional sense that we think warrior. I'm going to go fight and kill other people on the battlefield. This is, an el this is a man who is a warrior against the flesh. This is someone who is fighting with all of the intensity of a warrior on the battlefield. But fighting against himself. This is about hatred for your sin. This is about needing to be a warrior and saying, I'm going to destroy whatever comes up in the terms of whatever bubbles up from my flesh, I want to destroy because it's against what the Lord ultimately wants. You need to have a violence in you, is what I'm saying. Some of you uh, would think, well, that's a strange way of talking. Why would, you, why would you talk about violence? That's exactly what we're opposed to. Yes, that is what we're opposed to. Violence against the flesh is the thing that results in gentleness coming out of a person. A person that is gentle in a Christ-like manner has violently put down the impulses in them towards violence. It's kind of a, a, a tongue twister or a, or a riddle if you think about it, but if, if, if these things are bubbling up out of us, and we know it's true of every single human being that this is true, that I have evil desires that are coming up out of me, the violence that I show towards those evil desires is the very thing that causes gentleness and self-control and the fruit of the Spirit to come out because I'm violently putting down those evil desires. Now, that is, is a description from an outsider's perspective of somebody looking at your life. Now, what happens? So what, what does it look like then when a man is violently putting down sin in his own life? Well, here's what it looks like. It looks like, number one on our list, an above reproach life. You live your life like an open book. People know you for your faithfulness to Christ. They could watch you in the secret moments of your life. And they could see 
there's nothing, there's, there's no, he's the same person that he declares himself to be following after Jesus, whether I see him in secret or whether I see him uh, in, in public. He lives a life that we would call above reproach. He, what, what happens when a man takes violence against lust? Well, he lives in such a way that he is a one woman man. Now the ESV here, uh, I, I, I tran you know, translates it uh, in a particular way, but I would like us to see that I, really the Greek is just saying one, uh, one woman man. So ESV says husband of one, one wife, that's, that's true, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that, that if a wife has, has passed away and he marries another, or if there's, a, uh, if there's a, a divorce that takes place that we would consider to be a, uh, a biblical divorce, that's a totally different sermon, by the way. If you have questions about that, come, you can email me about that. Um, that. That he would be then disqualified because of that. Okay, So that's not saying, well, he can only be married once. What that's saying in the Greek is literally the words, or, or I should say woodenly the words, one woman man. He has eyes for one woman. So he, if he's, if he's married, he has eyes for, for one woman. I do believe that elders can be single. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that they're, 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 they're holding themselves and carrying themselves with a self-control that says, if I were to be married, I would be possessing myself in the same way where I'd be walking in faithfulness and desiring only one woman. They may not have a woman in their life in that moment that they can say uh, that, 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 they, that they desire in that way, that that's not a justified thing for them. However, they're, they're the kind of single man that is saying, yes, I'm holding myself in self-control. Okay, so we get into, we, we talk about things like like pornography, you know, and lust and, and a wandering eye and all of those things. All of those things are, are the antithesis to being a one woman man. And so an elder has has control over these things. Why? Because those these things don't tempt him? No. No. Because he is violently fighting against them. He's taking the precautions that he needs to fight against these things. What about sober-minded? What about sober-minded? That is a man who has decided to fight the desire to cloud his mind with drugs and alcohol. That he keeps his mind free because he cares so deeply about having a mind that is sharp, that's able to study God's word. What about self-controlled? The flesh wants to drag you into sin, but the spirit is in control of you. To be self-controlled is really, as a Christian, to be one who's spirit-controlled. I want to give to the Spirit. I want to sow to the Spirit. I want to make sure the Spirit has that control over my life and not the flesh. What about, what about respectable? People watch your life. Remember last week we talked about Hebrews 13, 7. Consider their lives of your leaders. Well, you, well as people consider you, they say, wow, that so-and-so is a respectable person. Why? Because there's a war raging inside of you. There's something going on inside of you that's causing what to come out to be respectable living. What about hospitable? Hospitable is what happens when you fight the desire to remain an isolationist in your family. Hospitable is what happens when you, when that sinful inclination to drive up, get out of your car, go inside your house, lock your doors, and say, that's it, it's just me and my family. When you fight against that desire, what comes out is hospitality. There's a, there's a deep spirit-filled desire to bring others in and care for them and, 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 and know what their needs are and just take care of them over meals and, and asking them how they're doing and things like that. Not being a drunkard is fighting against the temptation of drunkenness. It's a war against the temptation to drunkenness. Being gentle is being violent with the part of you that wants to be violent with others. Again, it's a tongue twister. Being gentle is about, is the reason you can be gentle is because you are violent with the violent part of you. You are putting it down. You are at war against it. Not quarrelsome, similar to being violent, right? Similar, quarrelsome is just using violence with your words. Same idea, I'm going to put that down. Qualified men fight the urge to quarrel over silly things, right? And, and every one of us knows this this desire, this longing to be right, right? I, I know it in my marriage, and I, it's, it's something that, 
that, uh, that for me, that I have to confess before my wife and for others. When we get into a, an argument and I feel this need, right, to, I've got to win this argument over something silly, right? You, you, have a, you have a fight, you have an argument, and then you think back on it later, you're like, what were we even arguing over? It didn't, it didn't even, didn't even make sense. It wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, uh, some Christian heresy that we were debating. It was something silly about our, our, our family and we didn't need to fight over it. And yet I had to win the argument. Oh, so, um, an elder needs to be putting down those desires. Those desires are there, but we need to put them down. We need to fight against them increasingly. How about not a lover of money? That's describing a man who's taken violent action against his greed. There's a desire in all of us to want to control, and money is, is at the heart of that. But, he, but a man who's an elder has said, I'm putting that aside, I'm trusting in the Lord, and I'm taking violence against the part of me that wants to control my life through money. So all of this list, in my opinion, all of this list is describing underneath the surface a warrior. Someone who is willing to take violent action, not against other people, but against their own sin. And when that happens, what will come out is a man that shows all of these characteristics that you just saw there in verses 2 and 3. We need this at Echo Church. We need men who can live this way. And others can watch and begin to understand what it means to take this kind of violence against sin. We need men in leadership who are willing to fight violently and to show others how to fight violently against sin. But what is not said here in the text, and what I want to make sure we understand as Christians, is what is underneath the foundation of our violent fight. See, it isn't this just this idea um, that I fight sin with my own power and I just got to somehow stir up in me this violence. I've got to just have this anger rage in me and I've got to sort of just direct it and I got to I got to pull that out, pull myself up so that I can do that. Like if you aren't feeling that right now, you just got oh I just got to stir up this emotion in me. That's not how Christianity works. That isn't the gospel. It's one thing to say, this is the effect of what will take place. And that's what I've been talking about so far. I've been talking about an effect that happens in Christians to take violent action against their sin. It's an effect. What's the cause? What's at the core of it? Christians fight with the power of the Holy Spirit inside of them. There is, a, there is something that has taken place in their heart that has only come because they've put their trust in Christ. Jesus said, when I go away from you, this is when he was actually walking with his disciples. When I go away from you, I'm going to send a helper to you. And it's actually good that I go away because you're going like, to want and need this helper actually more, believe it or not, than walking around with me as my disciples. This is going to be more powerful and more helpful to you than me physically being with you. So when I go, it's better for you that the helper come. Who's that helper? The helper is the Holy Spirit. And just as it, the, the Holy Spirit came into those men, and those men were changed, I mean, their hearts were changed at that moment. The same is true for you and me if you put your trust in Christ. If you've put your trust in Christ, if you've said to Jesus, I, you are my Lord, I am, I, am, I am submitting to you, then what happens is Jesus, because of grace, because of his incredible grace, says, okay, that, that faith that you just put towards me is actually going to give you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to actually push towards you this grace that's actually, that you're going to be able to uh, have, you're going to be enabled to live now because of, of that, that grace. It's going to be a power that's at work inside of you that's going to cause you to desire to do things like take violent action against your sin. So when we say men who are elders are men who take violent action against their sin, we are not saying that these are men that are somehow morally superior to anybody else. As if they've morally, they, they're made up of better moral stuff than you or I are. These are men that are simply saying, 
the Holy Spirit has empowered me. And, and, and in that power, I want to, I'm going to, I want to use all of that Holy Spirit's power to direct it towards my sin because I hate my sin. And increasingly more and more, we're desiring that everyone in Echo, men, women, child, everyone who's put their trust in Christ will live that way. So we're going to move on now in our, in our text. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 through 5. Let's look, let's look for our, our third question now. 1 Timothy 3. Verses 4 through 5, he must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Okay, so now we've moved, if you notice, we've moved from the sort of the self and the battle that rages within ourselves so that elders by God's grace become certain men they themselves become certain men we move on to now how those men care for other people okay so you can see this here so the question that I want to ask is this this is the question to someone considering eldership do others thrive under your care okay so the the first question was do you want it do you desire it the second question was do you are you a warrior against your own sin? So very self-oriented, right? How are you doing in the fight against sin in yourself? Now we've moved from the self, we're moving outward. Do others now thrive under your care? And it's going to be connected to what came before. So listen to the, here's the statement. Because qualified men govern themselves, okay, so because there's a fight raging inside of them, and there's a victory that the Spirit is giving them, because qualified men govern themselves, they can govern others as well. Uh, or they, they can other, govern others well, is, is, what I, is what I mean. So previous verses talking about a man's fight against his sin. Now these verses talking about those who are also under his care and how they're now cared for because of the character that, that this man is. So we're looking now specifically on how a man cares for others. And I want to argue that, again, that these two things are deeply uh, connected. So if you are looking for a man who's going to lead the church well, you first want to look for a man who is leading his family well. And if you're going to look for a man who's leading his family well, you first want to look for a man who's leading himself well. Does that make sense? So we've got three sort of levels going on here. The first is self. That's how we start in life, right? When we, when we, when we go free from our parents and, and, and we are uh, eventually considered adults, we usually begin that process as individuals. You might have a roommate, you might have other people in your life, but... You don't have yet, you don't yet have a wife, you don't yet have a family. You are an individual. And now, now ladies, this is important to, to know, and I think you know this. I'm just going to repeat these things to you. You know that this is true when you're looking for a man to marry, right? When you're considering the character qualifications of a man that you want to marry, think about it. You're looking at a man that isn't yet married, right? Now, now, you might be looking at a man that, that was divorced in the past or has previously been married. I'm just going to set that aside for a second. In my example, if you are, you're a single woman and you're looking, for, you're looking at a man that has not yet been married, how do you know that that man is actually going to be the kind of husband and eventually father that you're desiring that you feel like he should be? How do you know? Well, the, he, you can't exactly give him a test. You can't give him a, a family and say, well, how do you do with that? Let's watch with another family how you do. And then we'll see from that how well, you know, this is going to work for us. Right? You, you, can't, you can't do that. He has never been able to prove himself in that arena if he's a single man who's never been married. So what are you doing? You're, you're watching the way he interacts First of all, within himself, what kind of character does he have? Has he violently put down sin in his own life? And then you can start to see his relationships, okay, friendships and people that are like that in his life. But really, the, the main thing you're looking for is, is a man that, has, that is conducting themselves with character. And then you say, okay, based upon that, I'm going to take this incredible uh, risk, right? Marriage is a risk. I'm going to take this risk to yoke my life together with him, and, and, and I hope this works. Well, what is the church doing? 
The church is one step sort of downriver from that. The church is looking at a man now. The, the church can say to somebody who isn't yet an elder, we don't know whether you're going to have these qualifications and these characteristics. You, you've not yet shown yourself as an elder of a church to be faithful. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at your life and your family. We're going to look at the, if you're single, we're going to look at the individuals around you and we're going to see the way you, you exert godly care over them. And then as a result, we're going to say, yeah, we, we see that that's the case. We see that you seem to be exerting a care and others seem to thrive under your care. So that's the question that we're, that we're asking. Qualified men that have governed themselves, so there's character at the heart of this, internal character at the heart of this that causes a man to be a good husband and a good father. And we're looking for those things in these, in these particular men. Now, uh, the text says here, keeping his children submissive. Titus actually says this, if anyone is above reproach, this is Titus 1.6, the husband of one wife and his children are believers. That's what ESV says. And not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Okay, then it says, then, that's, then he can go on and be uh, an elder. Now, I don't think that Titus here is saying that this is that 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 uh, that I don't think the text here is saying that he needs to be uh, that his kids need to be believers, uh, and I've got a couple of reasons for that. Number one, in the rest of the verse, if you look at Titus one six, the rest of the verse, Paul explains what he means right after he uses this word for believers. And by the way, the word believers there is the Greek word pistos, and it means it could mean faithful, just generally a faithful person. Or it can mean a person that's put their trust in Christ. And we don't know, right? We don't know how, what, that, what that word means. But he says that these, these kids, right afterwards, he says that they're not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. So in Titus 1.6, he explains what he means by faithful by saying they're not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Now that makes me think that Paul probably means faithful there. Because if he said, if he, if he was trying to say that they were believers, I don't think he needs to explain because believers would not engage in that kind of behavior. So I think that it leans slightly in favor of saying that his children need to be faithful, which, which can mean that they maybe are not putting their, they maybe have not specifically put their trust in Christ, but they are just faithful. Now, now that, that needs further explanation. So we go back to our text. In our verse in 1 Timothy 3, 4, we don't see him repeat the believer standard. We don't, we don't see him say again the word believer. What we do see is him say his children need to be submissive. Okay, submissive means they may not be believers, but they are sort of in line with their parents. There's, there's a willingness to be, um, to be, they're not insubordinate. They are, they are, um, they are, they are listening and obeying to their, their parents, even if they maybe have not yet put their trust in Christ. Number three, the Bible depicts salvation as an act of God. So even the best parent cannot ensure salvation in their children. Becoming a believer is not check the boxes and do enough things for your kids and all of a sudden they're going to become a believer. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't raise them in Christian homes and teach them um, scripture and teach them from God's word. But the act of becoming a believer is something that that is, is, is an act of God. And it's something that takes place in somebody inside of their heart. And, uh, and it's a miracle whenever that happens. And so we don't want to lay that against an elder. Now, what we can say is your children are insubordinate. And if your children are insubordinate, that's going to disqualify you as an elder. That's, that seems to be clear from the text here. So we aren't talking about salvation. We're talking about the kind of a man who deserves and receives respect in his home. Let's continue quickly to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. And then verse 7, moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. So here's the question, if you are considering eldership, do you avoid both pride and passivity? Do you avoid both pride and passivity? And here's the statement, qualified men act decisively against sin, but they know it has been the Lord acting the whole time. 
Notice in this text, in verses 6 and 7, that there are two pitfalls here. The first is what the, Paul calls the condemnation of the devil, and the second is what he calls the snare of the devil. Do you see that there? The condemnation of the devil, verse 6, the snare of the devil, verse 7. What is that? What's the condemnation and the snare of the devil? Let's take the condemnation of the devil first. It tells us right here in this text that he has become puffed up okay, with conceit. Okay, that, so that's pride. That word is pride there. So what's the condemnation of the devil? The condemnation of the devil is pride, which happens to be the same thing that the devil possessed that led to his condemnation. Okay, so when we act in pride, we are acting in the same mannerisms and characteristics that the devil himself acted in that ultimately, as we understand it from scripture, led to his being removed from heaven and ultimately he and the, he and the angels uh, that we now call demons uh, being sent away and judged. So condemnation of the devil is the devil's sin. That's the sin that the devil himself uh, was originally guilty of. Paul is saying here that there is a special temptation in a new Christian to be really puffed up with pride. And I want to ask the question, why is that? Why is there a special temptation in a new Christian to be puffed up with pride? I think it's because when you become a Christian... Most of us, when we became Christians, our life changed. I mean, there was like, I know some became Christians at four years old, and that's hard to see life change at four years old. But for those of us that became Christians, even a little bit later in life, there was a transformation of our lives. Okay, so I can, I can point to certain things I thought about, cared about, did, that were oriented one direction. And then when I became a Christian at 17 years old, it was like there was a radical new orientation for my life so easy at that point to just point to ourselves and say, man, look at me. I am a, I'm a great person. I can't believe that I've, I've made all of these changes take place in my life. Look at how holy my life is now. And we're no better than the Pharisees at that point. And we're no better than Satan himself, who basically said the same thing. Look at me. Look at how great I am. So a brand new Christian, when they're, when they're going through that initial change that's taking place, they're not yet thinking through how did all this take place. They don't yet know the deeper undergirdings of how the Holy Spirit worked in them, and it really wasn't them at all. It was God who miraculously worked. They're just sitting there looking at themselves, looking at what's coming out of their life, going, this is fantastic. So here's the first pitfall, okay? There, there's, there's two pitfalls here. The first pitfall is that I fought sin by myself. I did this. Look at me. Look at how violent I'm being against my sin. Look at how great I am. Right? And that's the first pitfall. And this is the same pride that the devil feels. Now, there's a second pitfall, and it's in verse 7. And it's sort of related to this. So it's in this last verse, 1 Timothy 3, 7. Let's see, see it again. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders. So that he may not, not so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. So we saw the temptation of the devil, that was in verse six, and now we see the snare of the devil in verse seven. The first one was being like the devil. This one now is being trapped by the devil. In other words, a temptation that the devil is sending your way, and you become ensnared by it. This is plain old sin. This is simply giving in to, to sin at this point. And, uh, and Satan sets a trap for you, and you fall into it. And I have said this already, that we need a man who will fight against his own sin. That we need a man who hates sin and doesn't want to go near sin, is willing to put up blocks in the way to keep from going to that sin, is willing to call in accountability into, uh, to others and say, I need help in this particular area. Will you help me? And successfully, because... He's, he's fighting and cares deeply about, about fighting against sin, successfully putting sin down. But are you ready for it? But he doesn't fall into the sin of pride. He's a man that avoids the first pitfall, which is the snare, the temptations of sin. He's actively fighting against those, but Satan is happy if you actively fight against those to just push you over into the other pit. And that pit is pride. 
So here is a man that is actively fighting sin and yet at the same time doesn't fall into the, the, the temptation of the devil to just get super puffed up in pride. And I believe we need men who are elders who understand that they are fighting sin, yes, but it is God that is fighting sin the entire time. In other words, when I get to the other side of successfully fighting a particular sin and I can actually look at my life and I can actually say, wow, look at how my life has changed. And I hope you can. I hope you can as a Christian. Here is what God's word calls you to do. Look back on that event that took place and go, that was the Lord. Because it was. And the theology of this is more than I can get into at this moment, but I would encourage you to read Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 for this exact theology, this exact idea that it is God who has worked in you the whole time to make that a desire of your heart and also to accomplish the act. Friends, this whole thing of fighting sin is about Jesus' work on the cross being applied to you through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's about the fact that on the cross, Jesus died so that your condemnation would be done away with. And when that condemnation was done away with, the Holy Spirit is then given to your heart so that when you're fighting sin, it's God who's fighting sin. And yes, you really fight. Yes, you really do call accountability partners. Yes, you really do put blockers on your internet. You really do put checks in your own heart of places you will not go and things you will not do. That's real. That's actually happening. But when you get onto the back side of that, when you look back on your life at that point, what you're saying is, God, thank you. And what we need is men in the church who are willing to lead with that kind of heart, fighting hard, fighting violently, caring for their families, but at the end of the day, remaining humble because they know that it's always been the Lord. Let's pray. Father, would you create, would you build men in our church that will have a hatred for their sin and yet they will walk in a humility that knows that it is the gospel. It is the truth of the gospel. Christ's death on the cross, the Holy Spirit applied, given to our hearts, empowering us to live. That is the whole reason for why they are the men that they are. Create humble warriors, we pray. And help us as a church to discern who they are in our body. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.